Welcome to Diary of an Unemployed Actor with me, Milo Dennison. Each week I speak with up and coming actors, actresses, and filmmakers about the entertainment industry. We discuss success, failure, and share a few tips to inspire those of you who have a passion for the creative arts. Today I'm speaking with Maryam Hashimi, who is a actress, an artist, a model, and a psychic reader. And we get into some interesting discussions on those subjects. But first, I do need to give you a little heads up about um, this particular interview. It, it sound quality is great, so don't worry about that. But um, I, uh, I'm normally really good about having backup system in place for doing these recordings. And it's usually simple enough. I use Zoom to do the recordings, which uh, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that. And um, it does a pretty good job of uh, recording and, and giving me the recording. And I also actually have on my desk a recorder. So it's actually recording just my voice from uh, in the room and then picking up also the sound that's coming out of the speakers. And I've had to actually use this once in a episode in the past where towards the end it cut out and I had to switch to the audio, the separate audio, and it worked just fine. But with this interview with Miriam, I was using headphones to so that that way my speaker my microphone wasn't picking up on some of the noise coming out of my speaker which means of course I couldn't use the tabletop recorder like I normally do and of course the one time I don't use that tabletop recorder as a backup there's an issue with the recording and luckily Miriam was a wonderful kind of person and we had to arrange a second interview so uh, it, it's interesting because I, I mentioned this too a little bit with her. I um, I have kind of an outline of things I want to discuss with people, kind of the focus of this, the conversation and a few questions. But I also really like to let the conversation kind of flow naturally and see where it goes. Because sometimes you get into interesting areas that you don't normally wouldn't plan to, you know, as you're kind of getting to know the person you're talking with. And that's one reason why I'm generally not a huge fan of interviewing the same person multiple times. But um, but with this one, obviously we had to do it. And luckily, uh, she was a good sport about it. And we had a wonderful second conversation, which is the one you will be listening to now. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. All right, so let's get into this. Let's get into it. So uh, hopefully we can get roughly the same question. So I generally how I do it is I kind of have an outline. I have an idea of like the, some of the questions that I want to ask. But then yeah. I also like let the conversation dictate a lot of yes. it. So I, I don't know if we'll get everything the same as last time, but I'm sure it'll still be Just brilliant. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. It, it'll be brilliant. I don't mind repeating myself. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Well, uh, we start with... Um, cause so you do quite a bit, you're a visual artist, performance artist, modeling, acting, all that fun stuff. And so, uh, you've always been reasonably creative, like as a child, were you pretty creative? Yeah, I grew up, um, just drawing a lot because I was extremely bored most of the time. There wasn't much happening. And it also meant when I was drawing, uh, I didn't bother anyone. I didn't. Um, because I grew up with my grandparents. So it was convenient for my grandma as well for me to draw. So, you know, I just kept to myself, just didn't bother anyone, did my thing. So she was like, Here, here's, your, uh, here's your paper and your uh, markers yeah, as and as stuff. Long as it was a messy. I would only stick to pencils and markers and crayons and things like that. I never really used paint. Okay. Still on that. I was like, yeah, it was too messy. But she always encouraged, everybody always encouraged me to draw. So that, that became something that, I could get a lot of recognition for, so I just kept doing it. I, at school as well, I was always the best in the class because I just spent so long, so much time doing it. Mm -hmm. so I just drew whatever, and it would be whatever. As a child, I would just think, you know, it didn't matter. Most of the time, it was just um, the images I liked or the older uh, I was, I would be, for example, really keen to draw them in my favorite stars. And so it just was really self-taught. So it just kept going. And it was very obvious when I get to the age of had to choose a path. It was obvious that I had to go to art because I enjoy it. And for me, it was really easy. Obviously, I always liked acting, but I never really thought it was an option. I mean, there was, there was a moment that I had, um, I could still choose um, whether I wanted to do, for example, graphic design or I 
kind of briefly thought about theater, but my grandma immediately put me out of that desire. It's like, no, you're not doing that. Because in her mind, um, anybody who was in film and theater was prostitute, of course. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, geez, that's, that's like, makes you think back to the old days of like, you know, the traveling performers going around from town to town and they're like, oh, you don't want to associate Obviously. with them. <laughs> and then I, then I would laugh at her. I was like, but you know, you're enjoying all of these TV series. And this was in Iran and her generation. I don't know. Like they had a very, well, obviously because um, dance, theater, and before revolution, before Islamic revolution in Iran, uh, the movie industry had a really bad reputation. You rarely found films that were, I mean, they, they did exist, but there were a lot of movies that were just so sexual, overly, uh, it was just unbelievable. There were things like that being made. Wow. Um, and they were just like the common movies. Um, so it, there was a lot of bad taste, very bad taste. And not full nudity, but, you know, just, I don't know, it wasn't... Um, it never had a good reputation. So obviously the people that were in that industry, they were all prostitutes <laughs> in, in everybody's mind. So, and even in theater, because people were obviously more open. So of course, anybody in that field um, were considered very different to more of a traditional background, traditional people. There was obviously a lot of people that, um, still in Iran that, that, that they're very traditional and very um, follow their religion and um, so any kind of um, immodest behavior is very frowned upon. So people that were kind of open and uh, just clearly were normal, <laughs> just happy to explore their sexuality were considered prostitutes. So because of that, it had a very bad reputation in one generation, I would say. Yeah, and of course, after revolution, it's a very different. Um, it's like it's a very different scene, but still, it's pretty. I would say it's more open than any other kind of community of people. Of course, it's really laid so. Back. So, is there then any kind of worry? Because after the revolution, things got pretty strict there, to my understanding. Yes. So was film and theater also like did they put a lot of restrictions on of that course, of well? course there were restrictions on everything but i think that helped uh, the film okay. and theater in a way okay. um to some degree because when you're limited um you're actually um you want to find a way to be creative and you want to find a way to work so i think that made people more creative to try to say uh, what they wanted to say in the most creative way possible. So it wasn't obvious. And it kind of pushed people to focus probably on, on topics that were allowed. Um, so I would say like Iranian cinema, I think, improved a like, great deal after revolution. I mean, there were obviously good filmmakers before, but after revolution, it really, the whole world were interest, was interested in, in what Iran was producing. And uh, still, it is like the cinemas, um, I think there's a very strong um, practice cinema, like the, what, the, what they've created is just amazing. And mm. I haven't been up to date for a long while, uh, but... It's it's a, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a very powerful, very strong industry, with very good quality of production and and high quality actors. So, I think it really improved. Oh, that's good. So, is it the the restrictions yeah. that you so, think? So you know, even it though it's it? very hard for people to work. Yeah. Well, that's kind of one to wonder because you hear about that where, as governments tighten you know, the, the, the restrictions we you see in this in the U.S. right now to where then it's on like artists and creatives to kind of like subtly get messages out there to people yes. watching and listening and, and that kind of stuff to help yeah. kind of influence change. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, to be honest, it's, um, I think censorship is really good for art. Hmm. Really good. Because if you're really, and I'm talking from my own experience, um, the kind of work I was producing in Iran was probably far more outspoken than I would do here. Wow. And of course, I had the desire to, to, to rebel or, or, or say something that was quite uh, like a punch. And it, I was a different person, of course, but I could see how that could create a different um, narrative. But 
it's still, I wouldn't say necessarily for me personally, it was healthy because um, I was kind of still engaging with that and I was rebelling it. And was it really what I wanted to say or was I just doing it because I want to piss someone off <laughs> or, you know, all of that uh, questions. But I think if you're limited in any way, um, you can find lots of creative ways to to express yourself, and you could limit yourself with space. You could limit yourself with materials or topics. So all of these things can be uh, a fuel. So I don't necessarily say there's a bad thing. So I think um, I was brought up in um, in a kind of it was a very harsh environment. I mean, it was during eighties. We had the Iran-Iraq war and Islamic Republic, everybody had to, and, and there's still, our parents were still adjusting to the fact that they had to cover their hair. Mm. And it was just something that they were still shocked about. And um, so it was just, everything was just so surreal in a way. But of course, when you grow, your money growing up, you don't really think about those things as weird or just kind of more, you just accept it as your reality. And because of that, I think, um, I, think I, I had a very interesting upbringing because of all of those factors that are considered horrific, like, you know, when you tell people these days. But it's amazing what you can get used to as a child. And of course, of course it damages you. I have no doubts that, you know, mm-hmm. it's damaging. But also, you just uh, have a much wider view of, of the world and the, like, the, the different tapestry of like life and just what goes underneath and you know like one thing which is really interesting about iran's society is that okay you have to have you have to have all these um you you have these rules in place you have to cover your hair this is how you behave in the street and it's not only that it's the islamic system it's the culture as well so you need to always be aware that people are watching you so you always want to present the best version of yourself Hmm. so it's an indoors life is very different to what you show outside. So there is all these hidden worlds and things that you conceal and cover. And it's just how the culture is. Culture always, people are encouraged to please people and make sure everybody's um, happy with you and always show your best image. And don't show your weakness. Um, just, just really, it's, 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 it's so weird. There's lots of different facades that you put on. So it's a very complex system. Mm. And it's very exciting, actually. You know, looking better, it's like it's quite colorful. It can be very annoying. Well, it's very different from here. That's for sure. I mean, you know, it's all about like, you know, people can kind of dress, do whatever they want here for the most part. Yeah, it is very different. But of course, here has got this own way of... Um, etiquette and and, and it's, those those um, ideas ex- still exist mm-hmm. in, in much milder and in a in a less intrusive way. Yeah. But the, you're you're still kind of you have this British politeness, <laughs> which is a lot of times it's, it's kind of nice in place, but it it causes um, a lot of confusion. And it took me a while to actually really understand people here even though I was obviously used to that kind of um, um, what you say is not always what you mean Mm. uh, scenario, but I thought that here they wouldn't have that. They didn't expect them to to follow the same principle of trying to please everybody. (laughs) So it kind of causes people to be a little passive aggressive uh, without really expressing if they're angry with you. They wouldn't just say they're angry with you. They would just, I don't know, they they say it's fine. (laughs) I prefer brutal truth to politeness. What? So, what brought you to England? Then was it to study? Uh, no, I studied in Iran. So I did my gra- my degree in Iran. I studied graphic design. I was born here, so I was lucky. All my friends were telling me how silly and crazy I was for not going to England and study there, because obviously everybody wants to study abroad if they can. And and as I had the opportunity, they were surprised why I wasn't taking it um but i came at the time i was with a um with a boyfriend and i was thinking like oh i can go to england and that was the main drive the driving force to bring me here which which is really good um because i'm, I'm glad where i am i'm very happy uh in london 
um, the idea was that I would come to England and create a life with him and I would take him with me. And because I've got a British passport, I can do that. So it kind of felt like a golden ticket. Mm. And uh, that was the main thing that brought me to come and settle. I was so naive. Like, I'm glad I did that. But I was thinking it was just going to be so easy to, for me to come and settle and, and have him over. And he'll come and join me. And of course, that never happened. I'm glad he didn't. Um, so he never was, came and joined you? He never came. He never came. And I had this long ah. distance relationship with him for so long. And he went oh. on and on. And I had this, still this illusion that one day he's going to come and join me. Yeah. And I had created this fairy tale in my head. And, and deep down inside, I really didn't want him in my life. <laughs> I mean, like looking back, it was like I was obviously madly in love with him, but also very disconnected with myself and what I really want. So I'm just going with it because I said I would rather than that I really want to carry on. It was it was very weird. It took me a while to really come to this understanding. Obviously, I broke up, but it it, it was a very long distance relationship and painful for him and me. You know, it was. But um, that was the main reason I came here. And then it took me a while to settle and get to um, really know myself. I realized that I just never had time and space to really find out who I was or just allow my real self, true self to, to show itself. So that took a while. It was a bit hard. <laughs> That was probably my most It's addict. true though that sometimes you need to do that. I, I, so I was, I was born in a reasonably conservative uh, city in, in Washington state. And it wasn't until I moved over to Seattle, which is a very liberal city in the U S and kind of made friends there that I kind of actually uh, turned into the person I am. And it's thanks to that move. I mean, who knows where I'd be if I had stayed. Um, and yes. I'm certainly much happier. The friends, for. the friends you met, the very important the community uh, that uh, you, the people you surround yourself with. Uh, so I was lacking that. I was lacking that creative crowd at the beginning when I moved to um, to London, and it was very hard to find them because my, I had my family here, and they're all lovely and they supported me, but they weren't in the creative world. Mm. So. I couldn't really, I didn't know where to begin. And where do I find the crazy people? Where are the mad people? Because yeah, there, there wouldn't have been like a Facebook group or something that you could jump onto. Oh, then, exactly. would there? That was early 2000. Yeah. So um, that didn't exist. So it wasn't like an immediate. Um, and even when I went to neighborhoods that were considered artistic, I just didn't know how to connect to artists. It just felt really weird. And it took me a while. But I managed to finally connect to an artist group, which was called Artists in Exile. And I had to find a mentor uh, to help me to kind of take the steps to start my creative practice because I was just so um, stagnant and stuck and uninspired. So it, it, took, a, it took a little bit of push and uh, then I was, you know, I was in. Then, it would, then, it would, then I was plugged in. I could see them everywhere and I could find it. It's so funny when, when you're not really in the right vibration and you're not in the right mindset, you just can't find the obvious things. Mm -hmm. It's so magical. <laughs> and, it, and, and opening up to the whole artistic community, then I could find inspiration to do other things and realize, oh, you can actually try different stuff. So the acting, that I always wanted to give it a go. Um, was suddenly um, quite um, approachable and achievable, especially if you weren't necessarily looking for money. It's like, ah, just do it for fun. Yeah. So I started doing a lot of stuff like that, realizing you don't have to necessarily get paid to begin with. You can try it out. And yeah, so for a couple of years, I was trying out theater, but a lot of it was with Iranian communities in, in kind of very small, small productions and... Um, when you were finding out about auditions, did you just start by signing up for a workshop or a class or did you see, hey, they're auditioning for this? Like what, what got you into that? Uh... Um, I kind of, uh, it was through the Iranian community to begin with. So it was through word of mouth or at that artist in exile group. There was a, there was a lady, uh, Parvana Soltani, who is um, a writer, a director, theater director and actor herself. So, she was like, "Hey, do you do you want to do you want to be in my um, in my place?" I was like, "Yeah." So that was it. Was just the word, just meeting 
the right person. And then there was, I remember it was another production, it's very small production. And I think that was the first one I did that I saw a notice somewhere. I can't remember. I applied for it online. Um, I'm not sure where, but I saw it somewhere and I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to email this person. And then, and then we did that little, very, very kind of a cute little play. It wasn't very successful. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but it was a very interesting experience, and like, and he, but but he was a very established um, uh, uh, director, uh, and um, but but what he was doing at the time, it wasn't successful because I think for the first time he was doing something with kids, and it's just not great with kids. I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I think after that you just stuck doing things for adults, you know. Yeah. Things to go it it takes a certain type to be able to work with kids regularly. <laughs> yeah. It was this cup of tea, really, but um, plus it was mainly word of mouth. Just just meeting people in that community that wanted to do something, and I would, or it would be a short film. Yeah. Somebody would be doing. So at the beginning, it was like that. It was a lot of time, and then the performances again. I would just look into. I didn't necessarily go for auditions um it, uh, things i did were mostly around the performance still sector rather than um theater and films um then i remember i did then i signed up with star now and maybe i did, did like some extra work here and there but then um i got into another relationship that was very uh kind of i was very consumed by that like that was again became the center of my world so everything rotated around that most of the time mm. I spent most of my time with my partner so again uh, focused on, uh, more on paintings and things that I could do with him uh, and kind of uh, moved away from acting uh, but then in recent years got back to it again and it's really fun and I really enjoy just um, and modeling as well I uh, really, really enjoy doing it. And I feel it comes very naturally to me, especially certain characters, I think, um, are really, I think it's easy for me. Like, I can really scare people. So I would definitely love to do more terrifying things. And it just comes very naturally. So, like, sorry, scare people like playing, like, the bad person or? Yes, play okay. the bad person or just be a terrifying character. I haven't okay. done enough of that. I haven't okay. done enough of that. The escape room always working. With, with locked in a room, mm -hmm. uh, which was one of the best jobs ever. <laughs> uh, sadly, they're closed in the London venue, so we all be redundant, unfortunately, because of the whole lockdown and the fact that they're based in Excel Center and they can't open, mm. and well, probably until next next year. So they're closing down that venue. But um, in that specific um, job, I had part of it was to do backstory. And that was when I realized I'm just so good with scaring people without even doing trying. It was just, <laughs> just being me. <laughs> I just need a bit of lighting. There's something in me that terrifies people. So it's lovely to yeah. just tap into those dark things. Nice. And, uh, well, you have a unique look, um, and especially if you look at your, your profile, because like when you do your hair up, it's very uh, curly and kind of large yeah. and out there. And it's, it's just kind of a, it's a very unique look. Do you find that that helps you get certain roles then? Definitely. A lot of, uh, a lot of roles, um, a lot of people approach me because of my hair. Mm -hmm. And also I, I do extra work sometimes. And um, anytime that I'm uh, casted, it's because of my hair. They like the, it's not only the big, the bigness, they like mm -hmm. the gray. They really like the gray. So it's, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Glad. Most actors are probably like dyeing their hair to get rid of the gray, you know, to stay looking young. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot cheaper as long as I wash it and keep it healthy. And, you know, sometimes it's the most attractive to people when it's the most unhealthy. <laughs> when it's really dry and not they're like, we love that. So I'm, I'm at least trying to look after myself and not let the hair go mad and out of control because people like it. Because I'm realizing, no, I really want to keep it at least tidy <laughs> and it can get big anytime i want it to but i try to keep it twisted <laughs> <laughs> well you do because we talked about this last time and i thought it was interesting because you've done lifestyle modeling as well yes and yeah. do you find that that helps as a performer because uh, I, I think I mentioned this, I talked to another actor and he, and he did lifestyle modeling and he, he said like, if you can do that, you can basically play any character because a lot, you're just letting go of any inhibitions and that kind of stuff. Did you, do you find that as well in doing that? 
I agree. Um, it's very difficult doing life modeling. I mean, I think the most difficult thing is just seeing how people draw you because um, a lot of people, this, these are intermediate classes and they're, they're beginners and they can't draw. So just looking at your drawings and they, they make you look terrifying. <laughs> and I think um, that was the first um, shock to see myself portrayed like such an ugly way. And then now I really like those drawings because they, I think they tap into something um, much deeper. Mm. I think they're very honest drawings, especially if people are beginners and they, they, can, they, can, they can pick up the essence really well. So um, those are the ones I prefer these days. But at the beginning, that was shocking. So being okay to see yourself portrayed, um, being yourself to be seen is a very scary thing. So once you're okay with that, then everything else comes easy because you lose your shame completely. Um, and it's, it was such a great experience for me because um, not only I got used to uh, my body and just kind of understanding my body and um, just you, you connect to your body in a, in a different way. Also, you, you, the way you would use your body and, I, and, and the way you would pose for people for different occasions, it just brought out different aspects. And um, it was such a great, um, it, was, it was like um, a very intense class. And yeah, it's great for performance because I think body is, is our tool as actors, as performers, the body is the main tool and you need to know how to use it yeah. and need to really get to know it. And when you, just look at yourself through all every, everybody's work that look at looking at you from different angles that you'd never actually see yourself. Then you really, even visually, um, uh, getting to know yourself, um, in a very different way. Hmm. So I, I just can't recommend it enough for people. It doesn't matter what you want to do in life. Just some life modeling is a great life lesson, really. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of what he was saying too. Like it's a, it's an experience that you should have in, and especially for actors. Absolutely. And you really are in the body. You really, I think, it's connection to your body is, is just so crucial. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're training, you you are trained to, to to create that connection. But I didn't go through the training. You know, I had some workshops experiences. I never studied, uh, but that was my training mm -hmm. to connection to my body. And and I, I and growing up, I think I had a lot of acting ex uh, training, like because I had to lie to my grandma all the time. I had my boyfriend hiding under my bed <laughs> all the time, like he just lived there. Oh wow! And I had to I had to pretend <laughs> I had to act out all my life, and you know, all the time. Hmm. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm very well trained in that yep. sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, yeah, it makes sense then. Perfect. You're like, what? I don't know. He's not around here anyway. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. <laughs> it's very funny. Very funny time. I wouldn't do it again. The stress of it would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't have to now, so I guess that's okay. No, no. <laughs> you have a website, Mag Magic Print. Is that right? Yes. So that is something that is a new. That is a new website, and uh, that is for. Um, the work I'm doing with my partner, with my boyfriend. Uh, so at first, it's going to be just some t-shirt designs that we both kind of um, created together and sort of thing we wanted to see on t-shirt. And we said, hey, let's just make it, at least for ourselves to begin with, because we like that. And it will hopefully expand into more collaborations and creations. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're both excited about it. It sounds very like a beautiful. very creative household that you live in. Yeah, I I um I'm really grateful because we both uh, have our own practice. So he's a musician, a uh, bass player, but he's doing lots of things. It's not just bass. It's like mm -hmm. he's quite he he's playing um using lots of softwares and you know he plays keyboards as well and just just yeah, he does a lot. And he also um does um animation like glitch arts and things like that. So he's also creative. Um, visually too so he's got his own thing going on and, I, and I've got uh, my own thing going on and, to, and we meet in the middle sometimes and we do stuff together but it's yeah. lovely at the, this space that we are at the moment we both have our own space to create separately 
And uh, so, yeah, um, that, uh, we, we met collaborating. So it was all from the beginning, we just uh, started working together and create together. And then we kind of um, started a relationship. But uh, yeah, but the works kind of brought us together. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> so and the love for horror movies. <laughs> Oh, I wish I had that. Uh, my girlfriend uh, no. does not like horror movies, and it's so frustrating because I, I love, love horror movies. movies but yeah. horror movies and, and sci-fi is, is just so nice. <laughs> <laughs> we both appreciate that very much, and I'm glad. Because I cool. always was considered the crazy one that liked these things, so I'm glad that we can both hold hands and watch terrible things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. Well, you're also, you also do psychic readings. So tell me a little bit about this because this <laughs> fascinates me. Yeah. I'm fascinated by it. That is, that is a really, um, that was such a surprise to me because that's something that came out in one of the performances I was doing. Um, there was a space um, in a bar called Lumiere and a friend of mine, um, Zoe, was organizing these nights and it, you could basically try different stuff. Um, and it was a good place for people to um, get feedback, try out and get, it's a very small space. And the space had a cave uh, built in, like it was um, kind of a papier mache cave. And when I saw that, I thought, I want to be the oracle in here. I want to come be the oracle in a cave. So I did this one-to-one -one performance idea. I brought my bits and pieces. And the idea was just to connect to people. Because at that time, I was working at the Punch Drunk um, uh, as, as an usher, as a black mask in the Drowned Man um, play, which was um, in, um, it was in this beautiful, um, immersive world. And I was very, very inspired by that. The idea of the one-to-one -one performances um was uh, very new to me in a way experiencing it was, was was very new and i wanted to recreate that and kind of have that connection with the audience members so that was the initial drive and i started that and i noticed that as soon as people sat down in front of me I, and at that point i would hold their hand and close my eyes and just images i, I started seeing images and i went with it and i told them what i see and uh, it made sense to them. So I just kept going. So by mm. the end of the night, people, there was a queue, people were calling their friends, come, there's an oracle. <laughs> come see the oracle. <laughs> it, was, it was so mad how it just, how quickly it picked up. And um, so at the beginning, it was not very clear to me what it was. I just knew that there is, I'm seeing visions and psychic visions. So, but at first I thought that um, I can't do it seriously. I can only do it in a form of performance. So anywhere I could find the opportunity to perform, uh, I would do it. So I did it for another performance festival. I did it in there. But it was important for me to set the space to kind of create this Bedouin type tent like space uh, that was slightly timeless. And uh, I would dress up like um, somebody, you know, a Bedouin lady type thing that was the character that would okay. that mm -hmm. was coming to me and uh i would have a veil uh, but so yeah i just did that only in a form of performance or only did it for my friends to begin with and gradually i accepted the fact that no i think i'm fighting then I'm, I'm, I'm psychic there's no long no longer i need to fight this or you know just do it half-heartedly just really accept that it took me a couple of years to fully accept it and then um i listed myself in a directory and advertise my business as a psychic reader and now I'm getting customers hmm. coming to me for readings and it's just a really beautiful way to connect to people and it's just been gradually changing um, now it's going towards more coaching rather than fortune telling because at the beginning it was a bit like that and I realized that's not the way I want to go because future is still uncertain and we're still making it happen based hmm. on our choices in a present moment so so I learned that I like to um, attract the attention to the present moment rather than what may or may not happen in the future. Okay. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's great fun. I love it. But I no longer dress up for my customers. That would be oh. so weird. Oh, man, I need to put the veil. <laughs> <laughs> but I still perform because okay. that's a really good way. Uh, anytime that there is a, like, I did it the next building cinema. I don't know if you know about the event. Uh -huh. I did it. It's like an anarchist. They're, they're great. These guys that create these amazing film nights. 
you submit films and they do it now online you submit your film oh sorry what is it called again exploding cinema no i haven't heard of it yeah they've been around for so long these guys are so cool and they would in their events they would have obviously music performance and and you know but basically just um a couple of times up into their events so they would have so many projections side by side by different um, cameras and and projectors. Some really old <laughs> and you know super eight or like just just all kinds all kinds of projections side by side. But they would have obviously one main stage that they would um, feature different short films, and then they would have a very quick Q and A, and then move to the next, and just very quick. And I think there is um, there's a time limit. It's like I'm not sure. It was like three minutes, five minutes, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so it was imagining there. Um, I ended up doing the psychic reading. They were, some of them were very confused by what I was doing there. But obviously, the organizer thought like, yeah, great, let's have a psychic. <laughs> but that was the performance. Again, I, I created my tent and kind of had my shebang and my tools. Mm. And yeah, it was, a, it was it's great fun. I really like it when I do it in a, a dressed up kind of performance because it's, it's, it's a different thing um, yeah. a lot of people come for a performance that's a nice way to trick people because they come for a performance and then they get a reading and just the face is great they get very confused <laughs> it's like is this real then? <laughs> What's this <going> on? <laughs> because usually it makes sense to them i rarely get people that say what was what oh, okay a few times but yeah, it's great fun to confuse people sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, that must be great on like on a film set. Like I can imagine if I'm on a film set and I heard that somebody on the set did psychic readings yeah. during that off time when you're waiting for your scene, I'd just be like, yeah. hey, you know, what are you doing? Give me a reading. I'd be like super excited about that. Have, have, have you, you know, had that? I happen? do that, but I need to be up for it. I mean, I used to, beginning, I would freely do it mm-hmm. anytime anyone asked me. But now I really feel like, no, I'm gonna, I want to feel comfortable i want to have the focus if it's too busy and if i need to try to focus and it's just it feels it feels like work mm. i don't i don't do it when i really don't feel like it but a lot of times um when we speak and people hear about it they're like how do you do a reading for me and then i would do a quick reading for them you yeah. know we've got nothing to do we may as well just sit around and like do visions exactly. <laughs> yeah people people love it they're very intrigued usually is it possible to like, I, I guess, you know, as actors, right, we hone our skills through rehearsing, through going to workshops and, and just performing. Like with psychic, is it possible to do like, are the, is there mentorships? Like how do you, how do you of hone course. your skills? Yes. Uh, for example, things that helped me to kind of develop it further. And the main thing about it is that a lot of times you had, in my case, um, it was to basically learn to allow it and just go with it rather than constantly doubt and question. So like, I'm making this up. This is bullshit. This is my head. This is <laughs> because you got that voice that is just blocking. Mm-hmm. So I had to get rid of that. But I've got a, I've got a friend, uh, Maria Jurovleva, who is an um, energy healer and um, quantum healer. And um, she does uh, past life regression. And uh, she, she ran lots of, um, different workshops and I worked for her for some time as well uh, and she she was a great influence and she was a great teacher because she would have for example it was this was before I tap into I really open up to that and realize oh, I can see visions but prior to that she would have for example workshops that you could work on your psychic abilities by just the way she would do it is like she would have group of people groups of people and then um, she would hand an, an envelope around and you would hold the envelope and then in a group and just uh, kind of feel what the image is and then everybody would share what they see so there's like practices and and uh, different workshops and classes yeah you can you can basically go to school you can go to psychic school and just develop oh, wow. it in that way and there's like loads of different exercises and and of course meditation is one of the most important things you need to be able to meditate and just um tune into inner world and kind of um be able to quiet the mind because the mind is the one that is just blocking everything all the time you need to settle a little bit into yourself to let the magic happen. But yeah, there's, there's like so many things you can have online. And these days, the information is just available for people freely, freely even. It's fantastic. I've learned so much online mm. just by watching videos and lectures. And it's fantastic. It's endless amount of information out there now. 
Okay. Well, obviously, it's been fantastic talking to you again. So <laughs> it's been really lovely talking to you, Milo. Uh, um, if people want to find you, uh, obviously, we've got uh, magiprint.com. Is there any other uh, site or social media you want to mention? Uh, well, I, I've got my Instagram as Mar Hashem. And I also got for, for my paintings, they're, they're all like different websites. For my paintings, mayamhashemi.com. And uh, there's my Star Now profile as well. That's got more um, uh, details about the, the, the clips and the, the, the photographs of the, the shoots. If they're casting for something, how to, how to reach out to you to get you for an audition? Yeah, or even if they just wanted to see the stuff I've done, there's like a good selection of videos there. I'd rather just keep... At the moment, things are separate because uh, I think the website will be too crazy if involve everything. And for, for psychic reading, you know, like my own psychic reading on, on Facebook. <laughs> well, and I'll certainly throw the links into the notes of, of the... Thank you. Yeah, it's too many links. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> it's okay. you, have to, you have to keep it separate, though. I mean, and they talk about that with actors as well. You know, you can't put everything you need to kind of just have it. If you're going to have a website that's focused on acting, it just needs to be acting stuff. If you're a writer, you just kind of need to focus on the writing stuff. And yes. I know I have this mistake. My website has everything on it and it's just kind of, it's a mess. I kind of like to have a website that shows my universe as well. Just like everything in there at some point. Uh, I think it's okay. You can allow that to just show this is me. It's all the things I do. But yeah, at the moment they're all, they're all separate. <laughs> well, that's fine. That way, depending exactly. on what people want, they can go to the individual one. Exactly. If you don't want to get bombarded by, this is me, I'll do one of these things. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Thank you. Uh, Have a it. beautiful day. Thanks and it was so really much. nice talking to you again. Yeah, it was nice talking to you again. And for sure, I've got it recorded this time. I, could, I was kept checking and I made sure that was saying recording. <laughs> nice. And I was checking this and making sure this was recording. <laughs> it was meant to be. So. All right. <laughs> well, thanks.